Okay, so this is a talk uh, based on my own um, bitter experience um, aimed at <clears throat> researchers um, who were interested in setting up uh, some of their own dual EEG studies, because I know uh, there's quite a few of you out there at the moment. Um, so we all know why we're interested in doing uh, naturalistic dual EEG, um, because most of the um, stuff that we know about how the developing brain learns to process social information uh, comes from this type of study. Uh, so this was a mega, mega influential study uh, done by uh, Tracer Froney um, and others um, a few years ago now. Um, and what it does was it looks at um, uh, static pictures of faces flashing on and off into the darkness. Yeah. And what you do is you chop out your uh, brain data uh, relative to the moment where the picture flashes on um, um, and you chop out your brain data and you compare um, the brain response to two different types of picture flashing on, uh, one where they're looking directly at you, uh, one where they're looking at scones. Um, so um, lots and lots of other paradigms have used uh, similar types of things um, involving uh, presenting on screen um, kind of pictures, kind of static or dynamic um, images of faces um, in different configurations. And pretty much everything that we know um, about how the developing brain learns to process social information um, comes from these types of paradigms um, at the moment. Um, okay, so we all know, though, uh, that there are a variety of different problems uh, with this type of approach, yeah? So how does this type of paradigm differ from how our brains actually function during social interaction? Uh, so one, at uh, that moment where the picture flashes on and off, which is basically all you're measuring um, in an ERP paradigm, um, doesn't exist in the real world, yeah? In the real world, we never have to, our brains never have to process that, you know, moment where nothing's there and then something suddenly appears. So why are we designing our kind of paradigms to measure how the brain responds to something that it never actually has to do in the real world? Um, another obvious kind of issue with this, which is well discussed in the literature now, um, is the idea that this type of screen-based paradigm is fundamentally passive. Yeah, the experimenter determines what the child is going to see and then presented exactly the same, presents exactly the same thing to every child. Um, whereas um, in the real world, uh, that doesn't actually happen. Yeah, um, social interaction by definition is interactive. Yeah, and the other key point which really follows from that is. Um, in the real world, experiences generate behaviours. Yeah, so how we act determines what information we receive. Um, and again, this is something that our traditional kind of screen-based, non-interactive ways of measuring uh, kind of brain function during social interaction kind of really, really poorly equipped uh, to detect. So this is what got every, has got everyone um, uh, kind of, um, we've well, got lots of people interested in this idea of recording kind of naturalistic uh, dual EEG. Um, and we've been doing quite a bit of this. Um, I've had grants um, from this for the um, Economic and Social Research Council with Vicky Leong uh, and then the Le Leverhulme Trust. And I've currently got one from the European Research Council uh, that involve collecting and analysing a lot of um, dual EEG. Um, I pay published some papers um, uh, looking at this, um, including a review and quite a different kind of few different kind of papers um, that, that we're talking about. And this talk is really some of the kind of important you know lessons that i've learned um, from kind of mistakes i think in retrospect uh, that i've made um, on the way are really trying to encourage people you know not to make the same kind of theoretical kind of an analytical mistakes i'm actually going to start what i'm saying by presenting a couple of studies that aren't dual eeg uh, they're using fnirs um, um so i'm going to start with this you're going to see why kind of it, it, i think um, it's worth doing that um, so later and then i'm going to talk from there about how not to do an eeg brain brain entrainment analysis so basically i'm going to argue don't follow the approaches uh, being used in these ethnic studies for a reason i'm going to explain why i'm going to be arguing that the point of dual eeg has to be understanding the mechanisms through which kind of interpersonal entrainment, you know, these associations between the brain activities of two interactive people. We need to be understanding how this is achieved. This is what dual EEG is good for. And I'm going to argue that ethnis is very, very not set up to look at that. Dual EEG is that, that's what we're good for. And this is really the main message of the talk. Yeah. Then going to go on just to explain some of the more examples of how dual EEG can be used to look at mechanisms underpinning kind of entrainment during social interaction. Uh, just really quickly, we're going to flick through actual observer correspondences, kind of mutual anticipation, uh, shared entrainment to the environment and so on. OK, so I'm going to start, as I say, uh, with two um, uh, dual FNIR studies that came out. You know, I feel old and crusty because these are real kind of classic papers in the field. Um, and they've only been out like uh, two years, three years. Um, and the next paper, I think, was a couple of years before that. Um, and I remember them all coming out. Uh, so this is Elise Piazza uh, with Casey U. Williams. Um, 
um, uh, did a psych science paper uh, that came out in 2020, which really was, I think, the kind of the first of its time um, uh, in kind of looking at this in developmental populations. Um, and they got children um, to interact with an adult, um, either together when they were playing with toys, as they as they s s showed here, or apart, so pointing, placing 90 degrees uh, with an adult talking to another adult. Um, and I'll gloss over a lot of the methodological details, uh, but basically uh, they just looked at the correlation. So the correlation um, in uh, deoxyhemoglobin um, uh, between the adult um, and the infant, um, and they did some bootstrapping analyses to look at the correlation of brain activity between uh, diets while they're interacting uh, compared to this kind of a part condition. <clears throat> oh, lots of detail on how that was done, we can skip over for now. Um, and basically they found that between, between particular pairs of octodes, those ones marked here in red, uh, they found stronger correlations in brain activity uh, um, in the together uh, versus the apart condition. So that's one of the uh, papers uh, that I want to be kind of thinking about kind of as a foundational paper, you know, in the field, you know, thinking how, how can we use similar methods uh, looking at um, dual EEG. The other paper was a even older paper. It's only been, uh, it's been around for as long as five years, which makes it very hoary um, in um, hyperscanning terms. Um, and this is with slightly older children, uh, five, this is Vanessa Reindel um, and um, Kirsten Conrad um, and um, a group at um, Aachen in Germany. Um, and uh, they used it with slightly older children, five to nine year old children, um, and they sat facing forwards in parallel whilst playing um, this computer game um, in silence um, with their parent um, and with a stranger. Uh, and they viewed a screen with two dolphins jumping and their task was just to press the button at the same time as the partner in the cooperation condition or to try to press the button faster than their partner in the in the competition condition. Um, and everything that they saw, you know, the identical level, the, the movement, um, the, 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 um, uh, what they saw, what they heard, the timings, um, and they've even uh, kind of arguing kind of the times of the motor responses uh, were really, really similar between the two conditions. The only difference was this thing in there in the participants' heads. Were they trying to compete or were they trying to cooperate? Um, and they used wavelet transform coherence <laughs> to look at entrainment uh, between 0.08 and 0.5 um, hertz uh, during uh, cooperation. And they found some kind of areas of uh, significant difference, um, actually kind of in relatively similar areas. Uh, to what Bill looks at in the Piazza paper. Okay, so when we think about those uh, two different types of paradigm, uh, uh, both dual left nears, both kind of really, really kind of pioneering, you know, important early research. Um, obviously, there are a lot of things that might drive uh, the finding of entrainment in paradigm A, uh, the Elise Piazza paradigm, uh, that aren't present in the Vanessa Reindel paradigm. Uh, in, 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 in condition A, uh, sorry, in paper A, um, in the together condition, uh, they obviously were looking um, at the same things at the same time, uh, whereas they weren't in the apart condition. They were listening to the same things. They were having a conversation uh, in the together condition where they, they were having different conversations in the apart condition. Uh, they were obviously doing taking part in the same task. Uh, lots of different aspects of the shared dynamics, such as turn taking, um, that would have been present in the te to get together condition, but weren't present in the apart condition. Whereas paradigm B is really, really much, much, much more uh, controlled than that. You know, they really do argue, and um, I, I've talked a lot with Vanessa about this, uh, that everything, you know, what they see, what they hear, the timings of the response is identical. The only difference is this thing in their head, you know, competitive versus cooperative. Um, but that's kind of just stuff, um, just to kind of plant that, that that's important in there. Um, what I really want to um, kind of argue now is, um, what we can look at differently uh, from dual EEG. Yeah, so these are really, really important studies. Um, other people have been producing uh, similar, uh, you know, really, really interesting uh, dual FNIR studies. You know, Steffi Hurl's group with Trin Nguyen um, and various other people, other groups um, have have been uh, producing similar kind of dual FNIR studies. Um, from uh, my experience, I, 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 when the, the the papers that um, I've done. Um, on dual EEG have basically uh, so far taken pretty much a similar approach to this. Yeah, uh, uh, you do an interaction, you know, particularly like the together versus apart condition, you do an interaction, you take a lot of data um, and you average across the whole thing across for your synchrony um, and entrainment measures. Uh, you know, for example, a paper I did with Vicky Leung in PNAS um, 2017, uh, basically use exactly this approach and quite a few other similar ones that I've done too. Okay. 
Um, I also um, uh, review a lot of uh, dual EEG studies, and I've seen this approach uh, being used in, in lots of different studies. So this is what I'm going to be arguing is not the best way we should be setting up dual EEG studies. Okay, so what's not the way to do it? So how not to do it? Okay, <laughs> so take two conditions, for example, um, uh, just for the like the Vanessa Ryan dual co cooperative uh, competitive or together apart, or in my studies, you know, for example, it's looking directly at one another versus not. Yeah, uh, you only look at the brain data. So you average across your whole condition. You calculate your brain synchrony measure and you average it across the whole condition. Uh, you don't measure anything that's to do with the kind of the, the important kind of micro details of the behavior. I'm going to be talking about why those are important in a bit. You analyze every possible electro combination, um, every possible frequency range, um, and every one of the lots and lots of different types of synchrony entrainment. I'm going to be explaining a bit more about what some of those are. Yeah. You find a comparison that differs significantly between conditions uh, and you come up with a post hoc explanation for why you're only reporting that difference between conditions. And you conclude that uh, my experiment has shown that my condition difference enhances neural synchrony. Yeah. OK. <clears throat> so that I presented as a, you know, based on my own uh, failings in the past, um, how not to do it. OK. So why do we not like this? So what are the problems with this approach? OK. <clears throat> So firstly, um, not having a clear idea what frequency range is, uh, what electro combinations, what type of synchrony we're looking at, is just a very simple, you know, and everyone would spot this straight away, is just phishing. Yeah, what we call phishing, uh, uh, you know, hypothesis testing are after the results are known, um, uh, which takes us uh, somewhere between uh, the third and fourth circles of uh, scientific hell. Uh, in that lovely paper, um, if you've read it. Um, so that's pretty clear, yeah, and pretty much everybody would kind of pick that up straight away as a problem. Um, another thing which is really, really important um, is this idea of uh, what a lot of papers don't do, including my own papers, um, haven't always checked carefully uh, whether the observed synchrony or entrainment uh, was better than chance. They just directly compare between the two conditions and they don't compare with chance, yeah? Um, this is really, really important because it's actually quite hard to find in our experience to find kind of differences that do differ from chance. So this is Ira, um, uh, uh, my PhD student who's, who's produced this. So this is real data. So this is PLV, which is phase locking value. Um, so this is the black line here is the real data. Um, and the shuffled control data is just some stuff where he's just averaged at the PLV. Uh, but rather than comparing it between an interacting diet, he's just compared baby two uh, to mum two. Um, baby three uh, to baby one and so on and so on. He's just shuffled up, rearranged the, the, the order of the interacting dyads, uh, and that's the shuffled control data. Uh, and you get kind of quite a distinct kind of pattern uh, there with PLV peaking um, um, in alpha um, uh, between the real data, but you get pretty much exactly the same pattern in the shuffled control data. Uh, so that's really, really important just because it reduces your having an additional layer. I check whether it's different to chance and then whether I check whether it's a difference between conditions is a way of just reducing your risk of false positives, increasing your risk of reproducible findings, which is what we all want um, to look at. Um, so, so that's kind of an important. <clears throat> and then the other thing which is really, really important, and this is something that, you know, really, really is pervasive um, in uh, developmental EEG at the moment, is um, there's a lot of stuff happening when you just average a whole condition together. Yeah. So if you take like a five minute condition and just average the EEG data across that whole condition, there are a huge number of different events that have happened in that time. Yeah. Uh, so this, for example, is just the gaze. Uh, so you have a mum and a baby interacting. Uh, we just there's three objects on the table. Uh, so we just coded at 50 hertz, a so 20 millisecond uh, resolution. Is the baby looking at object one, object two, object three or their partner? That's the mum or are they inattentive? or is the data uncodable? Uh, and then we've coded exactly that, the same same amount of information for the mum. Uh, uh, this is uh, 100 seconds worth of data. So this is about two minutes worth of data. Um, and we can basically see that pretty much throughout, and this really does often happen several times a second, uh, we can't quite see enough resolution for this. The mum's gaze is flicking up and down to the baby, yeah, on in this type of paradigm. Yeah, as I say, often they flick up several times a second. The baby is also shifting gaze, but much less frequency. They tend to look at things um, uh, from there. But even for this level of resolution, we're not looking at individual refoveating eye movements, yeah? Uh, uh, which is, uh, we're just looking at when they shift from one object to another, yeah? So there are even within this long passage of 
unbroken baby paying attention to object two, there would have been a lot of individual eye movements that took place um, during this. Okay. Uh, so why is this a problem? Um, because uh, we know that um, um, uh, this is from work uh, that um, actually Ira as well has done. This is a paper that we did where we really have tried to do state of the art um, uh, techniques for removing um, uh, artifacts uh, from EEG, for example, the artifacts associated with eye movements. Yeah. So this is a machine learning um, ICA toolbox that we've retrained um, um, to try to try to kind of fix this problem. And we know very clearly that we can't get rid of this artifact completely. So I published a bunch of papers on this. Um, um, and so this is a problem. Yeah? If we're not tracking the behavior, uh, we can't be sure uh, that the behavior isn't causing uh, the finding because we don't we know that the behavior is affecting the EEG, but we don't know exactly how. Yeah. And um, before, uh, you know, people say people you think I'm too downbeat, this really, really is, uh, you know, downbeat for the types of studies I do, these naturalistic dual EEG. And um, this really is a problem that affects um, all resting state EEG analyses as well. I know loads and loads of people are collecting EEG data from kids viewing videos on a screen um, um, and not tracking individual eye movements while they're doing it. Um, um, and, you know, you read phrases like artifact was removed from the data. Uh, so it's just showing that it's not that. And that's just not true. Like we cannot, nobody can get an um, artifact out of data completely. Uh, so this is really, really important uh, thing uh, to bear in mind. And this is something that really is quite a pervasive problem um, in the field at the moment. OK. Um, and then the other thing which um, I've already kind of talked about in the, in the context of uh, phishing um, is this idea of treating all types of synchrony as if they're the same. So this is just an area where, you know, we're, we're very, very early stages in, in the development of this field. Um, and um, we know that there are lots of different ways of measuring uh, synchrony. So this is a great um, toolbox that um, Guillaume Domas' uh, team um, have just put out that allows you to flick very, very easily from lots and lots of different types of calculating synchrony. And I'm not going to go into detail about what these all are and what the differences are, but I could happily talk uh, for, if you want or just read the paper. Um, but the, the 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 thing that the state we're at at the moment, um, and and you really really get this um, uh, uh, a lot, is um, uh, that you know again stuff I've done uh, before you know early on in kind of my work in this area um, is assuming that one type of synchrony is the same as another type. Yeah. Uh, so for example, uh, you know you read kind of phrases like this all the time uh, when you're reading papers or when you're reviewing papers. Um, uh, and they've cited two papers um, as, as, as evidence for episodes of shared gaze enhanced brain to brain coupling. And one was a paper I did with Vicky Leong, uh, which um, used EEG um, to look at changes in the three to nine hertz um, uh, range. So, really, really kind of very fine grained time scale. Um, and we looked at Granger causal. So, did changes, um, um, frequency domain changes um, in one time series, do they forward predict? Uh, frequency domain changes in another time series yeah um, um we looked over a wide area of the cortex and as i say at this very very fine grain resolution yeah and the other paper that they're citing um as a um uh, as an example of this um uh, is a paper from joy hirsch um, and colleagues uh, they looked at coherence um uh, which is an undirected measure yeah so that's a synchronous measure so when it's high in one time series it's high in the other yeah um, and they looked at F nears um, over a time scale of 0.1 hertz, so one oscillation every 10 seconds, yeah, over a very, very specific localized region, yeah. So there are a massive number of really, really important differences between what these two papers are finding, yeah. One is looking at Granger predictive, so something is followed in time by something else, yeah. Um, 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 over a very, very fine time scale um, in electrical brain activity with EEG. Um, and the other is looking at kind of synchronous changes over a much, much wider time scale um, over a very specific region. Yeah. Um, so it's important that we appreciate the differences between them. We don't kind of link them together all as one for the very simple fact that, you know, if you looked and I haven't looked exactly at this, but I'm, I've tried lots and lots of different ways of saying, OK, just if it's high on one synchrony measure, is it also high on another? Yeah, I haven't looked exactly at this, but I'm pre pretty confident in predicting that if I measure two interacting brains with one of these measures, yeah, it wouldn't necessarily correlate uh, with the other synchrony measure. Yeah, my general finding is different measures of synchrony, even though they're called synchrony and everyone can treat them as the same, they don't actually measure the same thing. Yeah, if you're high on one measure, you're not actually high on another. Yeah, so that's really, really important to be thinking about. And it's really, really, you know, at a stage when it's really, really holding back 
progress in the field for everybody to using this one word synchrony to describe lots and lots of different things that don't themselves interrelate. Okay. But it's the last point I want to make, which is the really, really most important one, yeah? Which is there's a massive amount of detail happening in these types of face-to-face -face interactions. So this is just some of the measures uh, that we're collecting uh, from a, you know, this is a five minutes uh, worth of interaction, uh, gaze, hand positions, vocalizations, and there's way, way more facial expressions, you know, facial, facial movement, uh, and so on and so on and so on. And just averaging together all of this, like averaging it all out, pretending that, you know, uh, you, know you, you don't have this information, just looking at the EEG measures and averaging it out, yeah, um, is really, really important because it gets in the way of this idea of the understanding how interpersonal attainment is achieved and maintained. So this is a conversation, this is Antonia Hamilton, um, who's um, a, a researcher I'm a big fan of um, at UCL in London. Um, and um, uh, she's got this uh, mutual prediction theory uh, that she uh, put forward in a, a neuron a neuro reviews paper a year or so ago um, about this idea of um, uh, kind of mutual prediction as a driver of interpersonal entrainment. Yeah. And I was actually talking about this with her the, with her the other day. She almost exclusively uses FNIRs in her studies. And I was saying, OK, but you're interested in mutual prediction. FNIRs, we know, has got a time resolution of you know, plus or minus about five to 15 seconds. Yeah. So the lag between something happening in the brain, yeah, which causes increased um, oxygen demand in the brain, and that's showing up in the FNIRs signal, um, is anywhere between five and 15 seconds. Yeah. So you can't time lock your data um, uh, precisely to behavior with FNIRs. Yeah, in a way that you can with EEG. That's what EEG is really, really good for. Yeah. So she's effectively, you know, and I was saying this to her, you know, you effectively got a theory, a very, very nice, you know, influential, well worked out theory, but you're you you're testing it with um uh, uh kind of a, a method that means that you can't actually see your theory happening. Yeah, you couldn't actually falsify your theory if you wanted to, yeah. Whereas you could with EEG. Yeah. And this is something I think is really, really, really important. This idea that, you know, everybody has their own theory. You know, lots of papers are coming out at the moment. You know, what drives uh, these findings? You know, they're well replicated findings now that we do get various different patterns of association uh, between two interacting brains. Um, everybody's got their theory about what causes uh, these changes, you know, what drives kind of entrainment. Yeah. Um, but it's uh, but EG, dual EG is the method that will let us find out the answers to this, yeah? And it will let us find out the answers to this, not by averaging together over massive amounts of an interaction and then just averaging together the average brain entrainment um, during that whole interaction, yeah? But looking at how individual elements within that interaction drive changes in neural entrainment, drive changes in neural synchrony, yeah? Um, so, um, so we just published a, a paper uh, that lets you, um, as a toolbox of methods that allow us to look very specifically at how you get, you know, really tightly time locked changes in brain entrainment relative to individual elements um, in an interaction, yeah, on a time scale, on a millisecond level time scale. And I would really say, you know, I really kind of, you know, feel strongly that this is the only way uh, that we're actually going to be able to test and falsify some of these big, big theories about what drives neural entrainment. Yeah, what causes changes in neural entrainment uh, during an interaction. Okay, so just to finish what I'm saying before I go on to just a really quick uh, next part of the talk. So we've been talking about how I don't think, you know, based on uh, my own past failures, uh, which are uh, numerous, um, um, how I don't think uh, you should do an EEG brain brain entrainment analysis. Yeah, um, it's really important to be clear and um, pre specify what frequency ranges, electrodes, what type of synchrony you're going to be measuring, because they're not all the same thing. They don't associate. Yeah, really important to compare your observed entrainment with chance as well as comparing it between conditions. Yeah, really important to think really, really carefully about potential contributions of artifact because we can't get it out of the data. Yeah, nobody can. Um, and then also, um, this idea that is the kind of main point I wanted to make about looking at event related in changes in entrainment synchrony as a way of helping us understand how entrainment synchrony is achieved and maintained. Yeah. Arguing that EEG with its very fast time resolution, yeah, is the measure that will allow us to look at this, yeah, allow us to answer these questions. Okay. So just really quickly in the last last part of the talk, I'm going to be talking about you know, some of the things that EEG, dual EEG can tell us. Yeah. 
Um, so what can be useful? Okay, so um, I've just finished doing a, a, a review uh, with Martin James, a couple of PhDs in my lab, uh, looking at um, kind of entrainment at other levels during a social interaction. So we know that there's loads of evidence that entrainment does develop, yeah? Uh, so we've got mimicry of facial expressions, linguistic expressions, manual gestures, non-communicative postures, and so on and so on. Loads of evidence for that. Loads of evidence for obviously turn-taking behaviors uh, during verbal and non-verbal communications, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then some evidence for physiological entrainment as well. Yeah, okay. Um, so just to give you one example of this, uh, so this is some uh, kind of data that we collected in my lab. Uh, this is um, time locked to the moment where uh, this is a, a tabletop interaction. The short, 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 I showed you the pictures of earlier. Time locked to the moment when the baby looks up to the adult during an interaction. Yeah, and we're looking at the times when we we can see, you know, very clearly here that there is an increase in the likelihood of the adult looking to the infant. That's time locked to the moment where the infant looks to the adult. Yeah, exactly as we'd expect. Not rocket science, but we we can see it, you know, happening in our data as we'd expect. Yeah. Um. Uh, so we know that there's that type of um, contingent responding. There's also lots and lots of evidence for other types of contingent responding. Yeah. So, for example, you know, every time I smile at someone, um, if I'm a baby, um, it's very likely that, it's, that the chance that they'll smile back at me increases in response to my smiling. Yeah. So, the, I mean, just to labor the point that I've been making, this type of interactive contingency, yeah, something happens and then something else happens in response. Yeah, I look at my mum and they look to me in response. Yeah, or I smile at my mum, she smiles back at me. Yeah, with these F, with, with F near studies, um, which um, you can't time lock two individual behavioral events. Yeah, uh, all you can do is just average over lots and lots of uh, free interaction data. Yeah. This might, we, it's very hard to be sure, you know, it's impossible to be sure, you know, is this the sole cause, is this type of thing the sole cause of uh, the phenomenon that I'm observing, yeah, or is it nothing to do with the cause, yeah, whereas EEG studies that allow us to time lock our, our data to those things can tell us much, much more about, you know, how important this is as a driver of the findings, okay, so. We've got lots of evidence for behavioral entrainment in lots and lots of different ways. Yeah. What can dual EEG studies add on top of this? Yeah. What can they tell us beyond, uh, you know, uh, the, the simple fact that behavioral entrainment develops? OK, so we've got three things I'm going to be talking about. The first is um, actor observer correspondences. Uh, so uh, so this is the idea that um, when something happens um, um, in um, actor A, you know, for example, at uh, the moment where a baby isn't looking at their mum and then they shift their eyes, so they are looking at the mum, yeah? Um, in um, kind of Granger of causal terms, this is the sender. So if, I, if I'm the person who's sending the social signal, yeah? And then actor B is the receiver, so the person who's receiving the social signal, i.e. the person who's being looked at, yeah? Um, so, um, so one of the big, you know, influential drivers of, uh, you know, um, uh, kind of theories in terms of what drives interpersonal uh, neural entrainment is uh, that is it the case that something similar happens um, in the brain of the sender and the receiver at the same time? Yeah. Um, and is it this similarity which drives neural entrainment? Yeah. So this is the type of thing that we need a brain study to look at because we'd never be able to tell this just from looking at behavior on its own. Yeah. Um, um, everybody um, in the field's favorite paper at the moment is, is this paper from Lyle Kingsbury uh, that came out. Um, well, certainly everyone I talked to, probably not everyone, 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 but uh, lots of people uh, really, really love this paper. Uh, justifiably, it's a wonderful paper um, uh, uh, from 2009 um, in Cell. Um, uh, they looked in mice. Uh, they, re they recorded uh, from the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex with a multi uh, cell uh, cellular array, so to pick up activity in lots of different uh, neurons. And they basically found support exactly for this theory of actor observer correspondences. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so they observed uh, what the uh, mice were doing during the interaction. Uh, they found uh, some cells uh, that coded uh, when I do something. Um, and they found some some yellow cells that responded uh, when they see my partner doing the same thing. Yeah. Uh, and then they had a nice strong finding of um, um, kind of um, synchrony, neural synchrony between the interacting mice. And they found that um, when they uh, killed, uh, when, they, when they took uh, the, the, the activity of these particular cells that they had found um, out of their um, uh, neural synchrony measures, it basically killed the finding that neural synchrony was there at all. Yeah. Um, so basically, they were arguing that it's these actor observer cells that do the same activity, uh, depending on uh, whether I do it or whether I'm interacting with someone who does the same thing. Uh, they're driving neural synchrony. OK, so we've actually tried. Um, um, so this is definitely a, a, a type of hypothesis 
uh, that uh, we can test uh, very nicely. Uh, and as I say, it's, it's a, one of the simple ways in which, you know, neural synchrony can tell us something that just simply observing behavior can't. Yeah. Um, uh, we actually looked at it incidentally um, uh, in terms of um, mutual gaze. Um, so, uh, so at the moment, uh, this partner A looks to, uh, this is the mum looking to the baby, yeah, um, um, and, and they're either, the mum shifts her gaze to either look to the baby uh, at a time when the baby is looking to the mum, uh, so this is mutual gaze, um, or uh, the mum looks to the baby at a time when the baby isn't looking at the mum, yeah, so that's a, a, a gaze shift uh, to non-mutual gaze, yeah. Um, and obviously, in these cases, uh, the mum is the sender and the baby is receiver, but you just have to flip it the other way around to make the baby the sender and the mum the receiver. Yeah. Um, and we basically time locked our data um, to those moments, the onset of gaze. Yeah. Uh, and we looked at the onset of gaze in the person who'd done the gaze shift, the sender, versus the onset of gaze in the person who received the gaze shift, i.e. the person who's being looked at. Yeah. Um, and what we found when we time lock this data, this, by the way, has is, is, is just been published um, uh, in scientific reports. And um, uh, what we found when we did this uh, was we found nice big uh, brain changes um, as we were expecting in the sender um, um, of the uh, kind of person who does the case shift. Um, and we didn't find any changes at all in the person who's being looked at during the interaction. Yeah. Um, they, we were quite surprised by this. It wasn't at all what we were expecting. Um, we spent a long time uh, looking at data quality. Uh, there's a large supplementary materials in this paper uh, where we're you know, testing the, the quality of our data, running other types of ERP analysis with the data and arguing that it's actually pretty good quality data uh, that we've certainly spent a long time cleaning um, and worrying about um, kind of artifact in. Yeah? Um, but we really kind of aren't finding kind of in this, in this study uh, kind of receiver effects at all. So that's interesting. Back to the example that I started with, you know, this moment where, you know, uh, this this kind of classic study with faces flashing on uh, and they found differences in direct versus averted gaze. Yeah. Which has been used as the basis for many, many theories about how babies kind of learn to process social information. We're not replicating it. Yeah. Uh, so the equivalent during a naturalistic setting is I'm, 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 I'm interacting with my mum. My mum looks to me. Yeah. And we're really suggesting that naturalist says you don't get any brain responsibility to that type of thing. OK. But that's not to say that there's no point in looking at actual observer correspondence. This, that's just one thing that we looked at. Lots and lots of other ways to look at that. You know, for example, in that Lyle Kingsbury paper that I talked about, um, um, and Zhang is another, uh, Zhang et al. Um, is a paper um, in the same issue of Cell uh, where they looked at it in bats um, and they found similar, um, similar types of things. So definitely something that we can be using dual EG to look at. Uh, another thing that we can be looking at is mutual anticipation. So uh, this is um, Antonia Hamilton's theory that I mentioned a little bit a while ago. Um, and this is the idea of, you know, not 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 synchronous, but time lagged associations. So, you know, at the moments where the gaze shifts from one person being the sender uh, to the other person being the sender, uh, do you get in some way, you know, synchronous patterns to do with the end of one turn and the start of someone else's turn? All this idea of anticipation. So, uh, do my behaviors, you know, do, do we get kind of mutual predictions? So, am I trying to forward predict? Is my brain activity forward predicting your behavior? Yeah. So, if we're looking at time lagged relationships, can we get that? Yeah. Um, I haven't got much on that um, uh, because it's not something that we've looked at, but it definitely is something uh, that is possible to look at um, and is definitely something that brain brain studies with their brain brain dual EEG with their very, very high time resolution can allow us to look at. Um, uh, uh, and it will tell us something beyond what we get from merely looking at behavior, okay? Um, and then the last thing I wanted to look at as things that we can be looking at in dual EG studies, this idea of shared entrainment um, to the environment, yeah? Uh, so this is, uh, uh, you know, lots of methods uh, for uh, looking at this. Uh, Sarah Jessen's done a nice couple of methods, uh, sorry, Sarah Jessen's done a nice couple of papers um, on this method, uh, the multivariate temporal response function, which is basically regressing um, either the auditory information or the visual information, they actually do both in this paper, um, onto the EEG signal. Yeah? Uh, and we've actually got some data some, um, suggesting that, you know, even if it's the mum's speech, uh, so the amplitude envelope of the mum's speech during a free interaction, it does regress on significantly onto the baby's brain signal, which is nice because it's, you know, quite, it looks, you know, certainly early days, but it looks quite a robust signal compared to some of the other things that we're looking at. Okay, so if I've just got two brains, we talked about this earlier in the context of the Elise Piazza paper. So if I've just got two brains, yeah, 
Um, and, you know, they don't even have to be in the same room. You know, one could be in Manchester, one could be in, you know, London. And they're listening to the same piece of music at the same time. Yeah. And both brains are, you know, um, are reacting to the auditory um, kind of content of the music. Yeah. So you would expect kind of synchronous patterns. If you then look directly at the relationship between the two brains, you would expect to see similarities, which is obviously in this case, very, very de definitely driven by the fact that they're both listening to the same thing at the same time. Yeah. Um, whether this counts as brain synchrony depends on your definitions. Uh, for someone like Clay Holyroad, uh, it def definitely doesn't. Uh, for others, it definitely uh, would count as kind of synchrony. Um, this paper just came out. This paper came out. It's actually one of the early papers, 2016. Um, um, and, and they actually did something very similar. Uh, so they got lots of different people um, in a, a fMRI scanner to watch a movie. Uh, and then they looked at the correlations in the brain activity of the different people as they were listening to the movie. And they found things that... Um, you know, momentary configuration of the dorsal medial uh, frontal cortex were, were highly replicable of our groups. DMN coupling strength, that's default mode network coupling strengths, predicted memory of narrative segments. So basically, the stronger the patterns of the association between the default mode network, the better the recall. Of it, yeah. So this is the moment where, um, uh, you know, I start to think that this does get to the point where it's something that we can tell useful information. Yeah. So if it's just looking at does my brain respond to the auditory information, do two brains experiencing the same auditory information respond in the same way? Yeah. Then that's probably less interesting to most people. Uh, but looking at this idea, um, just as they did in that Simone paper I just mentioned about whether cognitive factors such as how well I'm understanding something, yeah? Do they mediate shared entrainment to a common stimulus, yeah? So this is now getting back into the area where most people would say this is something that legitimately we can look at in a brain-brain analysis. Um, and it's definitely something that we need to be measuring brain activity as well as just behavior to be looking at, okay? So that's all I've got to say, just to uh, finish it up. Um, so I've talked about how not to do an EEG brain brain entrainment analysis. Uh, it talks about the importance of you know, not fishing, uh, pre-specifying our frequency ranges, electrodes, the type of synchrony. Uh, we talked about the importance of comparing the observed data with chance as well as just between conditions. Uh, we've talked about the potential contributions of artifacts, really, really important area. And then my main message has been this idea that EEG is the method that will allow us to understand how entrainment or synchrony is achieved and maintained, certainly of the methods that we use uh, with humans. Um, um, and then um, just really, really quickly at the end, I talked about three different ways in which we can um, uh, be thinking about kind of what we can be using uh, dual EEG uh, to be measuring uh, beyond measuring observed behavior, <coughs> actual observer correspondences, mutual anticipation, um, and shared entrainment to the environment. Um, Okay, that's all.